Hi, and welcome to another lecture in fluid mechanics. Last time, we covered all the basics of turbulent flow. Why we study turbulence, what it physically is, why it happens, and how we analyze it. Turbulent flow is a mess of chaos and unpredictability that's very difficult to study theoretically. But today, we're going to try. The topic for this video is Reynolds decomposition. This is a technique that allows us to approach analyzing turbulent flow, despite its challenges. By splitting of time-varying flow trait, like velocity, into the average component and fluctuating component, we can derive a set of equations called the Rand's equations, which stands for Reynolds Average Navier-Stokes equations. We have a lot to get to, so let's jump right in. If you recall, in our turbulence video, we compared laminar and turbulent flow out of our faucets as a visual exercise. Laminar flow was clean, smooth, and steady, while turbulent flow was messy, rough, and unsteady. If we were to place a measurement device in the center of our faucet flow that measured velocity, we could see time traces of the velocity signals for each flow type. In the streamwise direction, which here is vertical, we would see that the laminar flow would have a smooth, constant streamwise velocity at that measurement point. And the other directions of velocity would be nearly perfectly zero. For turbulent flow, streamwise velocity measurements would vary dramatically in time, but it would fluctuate about a constant mean velocity. We would see similar behavior for the other velocity components, V and W. They would fluctuate dramatically about some zero point. The velocities would appear kind of constant, but clearly not steady. You might be wondering if only we could separate the mean behavior and the messy behavior and treat them separately. There is a way, and that is through a fairly simple concept called Reynolds decomposition. Reynolds decomposition is the act of separating a set of instantaneous observations into their mean and fluctuating components. A simple, but as we'll find out, powerful concept. Consider the velocity signal, which is in this case a function of time. We can break u up into the sum of u bar and u prime. Here, u bar is the ensemble average or time average, and u prime is the fluctuating component that's left over. We can look at it visually. The instantaneous time trace of the velocity field has a clear non-zero mean with fluctuations about that mean, and Reynolds decomposition is just defining those two things to be separate, the mean and the fluctuation. Although we keep showing examples of velocity, in fluids we apply this also to the pressure field. Sometimes we can even apply it to the density and temperature fields for compressible or varying temperature flows. Now, we've mentioned the concept of an average, specifically an ensemble average, a few times now. In general, the concept of an average flow field can be counterintuitive, especially in fluid mechanics. For a given flow, like the channel flow here, at three different times the flow could look three very different ways, each being a different, jagged, chaotic mess. But, if you were to add these up and divide by the number of observations, you would get a sort of average of the flow. The average is made up of many different instants or observations, and the more observations you have, the more accurate your average is. In turbulent channel flow like we have here, the time average velocity profile of many observations would look smooth and reasonable. Though, what's important to keep in mind is that this average flow never physically exists. At no single point in time will the flow ever look like this in turbulent flow. Averages only exist in the statistical sense. This average profile is just saying that statistically speaking, at any given height location, the velocity is most likely to be this value. You might be thinking, well, if it never exists, what good is it? But in application, the average is typically what matters. In aircraft, we are concerned with the average lift and making sure that there's enough lift to keep the plane in the air. In ships, the average drag is what dictates fuel consumption, and the budgets are planned around this average. 
In pipe flows, the average pressure drop is what tells you what type of pump you'll need and how long to make the pipe. Averages are super important, with few exceptions. One of those exceptions is failure analysis, where we're concerned with the worst case scenario and not the average scenario. Although you might design an aircraft wing to provide the right average lift, you also better be sure that a large pressure fluctuation won't break it in half. Now that we have an understanding of what Reynolds decomposition is and why it's important, let's consider how we apply it to our equations. First, we're going to do some simple examples. Consider a 2D incompressible conservation of mass equation, du dx plus dv dy equals zero. Rho is a constant and W is zero, so we only get these two terms. Now we define that each velocity variable separates into the mean and fluctuating component, so u equals u bar plus u prime and v equals v bar plus v prime. Plug these back into the original equation and distribute the derivatives into the parentheses. We end up with an equation that has four terms instead of two terms. And you might be thinking, great analysis, the equation just got twice as long. But to this equation, we're going to apply a series of math tricks to get the equation to tell us two useful and separate things. First, we want to average our equation. If we have a plus b equals c, then that means the average of a plus the average of b equals the average of c. Simple enough. Let's average our equation above and get the following. Now we have an average over our equation, but you might notice that we're going to end up averaging values that are already averages, u bar and v bar, and we're also going to end up averaging fluctuations, u prime and v prime. Throughout the video today, we'll be dealing a lot with ensemble or time averaging, so let's go over some general rules of averaging. These rules are absolutely important to try and remember, as they make our life a lot easier down the road when we're deriving the serious equations. The first rule, the average of a fluctuation is zero, by definition. A fluctuation is a signal that has had its average removed already, so its average is zero. Second, taking the time average twice is the same as the time average once. Third, you can bring a time average into a sum with no problems, and you can also bring them into products of a mean and a fluctuation. This last part's important. You cannot bring them into all products, as we'll see later, but it's okay to do if one of the terms is an average quantity. Lastly, you can bring the averages inside derivatives and inside integrals. But, just so it's clear, you cannot distribute an average into the product of two general quantities. If the function f and g both vary in time, then the average of f times g is not the same as the average of f times the average of g. Here we can quickly show this, this is the case with some simple arithmetic. When you multiply the two, you get an extra term, an f prime times a g prime, and the average of this is not necessarily zero. We will see later on why this is particularly critical. Okay, so now we're familiar with some rules of averaging. Let's use them on our original equation. Bring up the equation as we left it, four terms, some with bars and some with primes. As we just learned, the averages go into our derivatives and the averages of the fluctuations in the derivatives go to zero. This leaves us with an expression that looks like the same as the original conservation of mass equation we started with, but with mean quantities as variables. But we can't stop here. Let's try and squeeze this equation for all it's worth. This is a separate equation that says the mean quantities sum to zero, and it can be reapplied to the original equation that has both mean and fluctuating quantities. This gives us a second equation that says the fluctuations independently also satisfy the equation. So with this simple example of 2D incompressible conservation of mass, we got two useful equations through Reynolds decomposition and averaging. The mean satisfy conservation of mass, and the fluctuations satisfy conservation of mass separately. Now, it seems like all we did was change u to either u prime and u bar, and v to either v prime or v bar.
and that gave us two equations. But it's not always this simple and straightforward, and unfortunately it's not as easy as replacing variables. That's because nonlinear terms, or products of two functions, cause issues with the averaging. Remember before, we said the average of the product of two fluctuation signals is not necessarily zero. The easiest way to show this is to consider a sinusoidal function. Sine waves are naturally zero in the mean, oscillating or fluctuating about that zero. Here, f prime is a sine wave, so its average is zero. Consider a second sine wave, g prime, which is also zero in the mean, a purely fluctuating function. But what happens if we multiply f prime and g prime? The signal is always positive, and it oscillates about some non-zero average. So, even though independently the average of f prime and g prime are zero, the average of their product is not. This is because the two signals are correlated, in this case perfectly correlated. Any amount of correlation between two fluctuating signals will make their product non-zero on average. This is actually pretty important to fluid mechanics, because we get nonlinear terms in our equations, like u times v, and these two velocity signals are often correlated. If a bump in a channel flow causes the streamwise velocity to fluctuate, it also likely impacts the vertical velocity, so the velocity fluctuations in the different directions tend to correlate with one another. Let's see this nonlinearity in action for a fluid's case. Consider a simple statement that the kinetic energy of a fluid is a constant. This isn't necessarily a true equation, it's just one we've set up as a toy problem. Some might recognize one half rho u squared as the dynamic pressure, popularly used in the Bernoulli equation and aerodynamics. One half here and rho are constant, so in essence we are saying u squared is a constant. Let's apply Reynolds decomposition and then square and distribute the terms accordingly. Now, take the average of this equation on both sides. By now, we're experts on the rule of averaging, and we notice that the middle term becomes zero while the first and last terms stick around. If we compare back to the original, we had u squared equals a constant, a nonlinear equation, and then Reynolds decomposition and averaging got us a new equation with two terms instead of one. One term has the averages squared, and the other is the average of the fluctuations squared. This leftover term represents the correlation of the functions. Hopefully what this example showed us is that when things are nonlinear, we often get extra terms, and it's not as simple as just replacing variables. So, these two simplified examples showed us the power and nuances of Reynolds decomposition. I think we're ready for the real thing. When you apply Reynolds decomposition and averaging to the set of conservation of mass and conservation of momentum equations for a fluid, you get what's famously referred to as RANDS. RANDS stands for Reynolds Averaged Navier-Stokes. Amazingly, this new set of equations somehow has three people's names in it. The most important attribute of the RANDS equation is that it allows us to explore the chaotic world of turbulence theoretically because we can apply assumption to the average equations. Let's see how it works. For the remainder of this video, we will derive RANDS and do a simple channel flow analysis example using the new equations. For these derivations, the general procedure is as follows. First, we obtain the starting equation whether it's the conservation of mass or momentum equation. Second, we apply Reynolds decomposition, changing all of our instantaneous variables into sums of means and fluctuations. Third, we'll take the average of the entire equation and apply our rules to get rid of the terms that are zero on average. Finally, we will obtain new equations that apply only to averages, meaning that we do not expect these equations to predict what happens at any given instant, but what happens statistically on average. Now, we're going to go through the derivations.
We're going to move quickly through them because it's mostly just arithmetic, but I wanted to write it out completely for anyone interested. If you get bored of derivations, you can skip ahead in the video to the box Durand's equation at the end and continue from there and you won't miss any physics whatsoever. All right, here we go. Start with the conservation of mass for an incompressible fluid. This is a lot like the example we used at the beginning of the video. Reynolds decompose and then average. Use our averaging rules to remove some terms and we get a new equation for the means. Using this equation, we can put it back in the original equation to get a separate equation that talks about the fluctuations. So, two equations of conservation of mass. And we're done. On to the conservation of momentum. We'll do it for the x direction, but the derivation applies similarly to the y and z directions. Here we're going to use a neat trick we do a lot in dealing with the conservation of momentum and derivation. Often, we will make use of the product rule or other calculus rules to get terms to group together that look a lot like other equations. In this case, we use the product rule to bunch together terms that make up conservation of mass, which we know to be zero. The end result is for our benefit. In this case, it makes it easier to do math with the Reynolds decomposition because it moves all the products into the derivatives. Let's use this new set of terms in the left-hand side of the original conservation equation. Now we need to do Reynolds decomposition and averaging to this long equation, which has entirely too many terms. Using our rules, we can pluck out the terms that become zero with the averaging we're about to apply. Note here for shorthand, the i subscript means that it applies to all three directions, so u sub i is separately u, v, and w. Now we have a new equation with mostly averages, but some products of fluctuations are still around. Remember that product rule from before, where we used to rearrange things? Let's Uno card reverse it and unrearrange our mean product terms on the left hand side. It's really the same product rule with the conservation of mass applied again. And that's how we get the final form of the conservation of momentum equation in the x direction. If we did it for the other two directions, y and z, along with the ones we have already done, we would get the following full set of equations. First is the conservation of mass equations we derived. There are two of them now, one for the means and one for the fluctuations. And we have the conservation of momentum equations. Here I drew the skeleton of the equation in red. This is constant regardless of the direction you are concerned with. In white, the variables are the ones that you change if you change from x to y to z. For example, for the momentum in x equation, we have u's and x's. For the momentum in y equation, we would have v's and y's. And for the momentum in z direction, we would have w's and z's. This means there are three separate momentum equations here. In the end, we have the Reynolds Average Navier-Stokes, or RANS for short. This is the conservation of mass in all momentums with Reynolds decomposition and averaging applied for an incompressible fluid. The first thing you might notice is that they look a lot like the original conservation equations, and that's because they are. However, there are groups of terms that are the products of fluctuations, circled here, that can really cause headaches for turbulence analyzers. 
These terms are called the Reynolds stresses. They're hard to predict, they're hard to measure, and they're even harder to compute. This is because the fluctuations range dramatically in scale and frequency in most turbulent flows. Physically, the Reynolds stresses are analogous to viscous forces. In a video a long time ago, we derived the original conservation of momentum equations, and we talked about how the viscous forces are like molecules jumping from one train or streamline to another. Each time they jump, they bring different momentum and impart a local force. Turbulent renal stresses are similar, except the turbulent fluctuations are throwing particles of velocity all over, and they get into different streamlines and change the local velocity. So, the turbulent fluctuations get in their own similar forcing terms. So now that we have the Rand's equations and we understand where they come from, what do we do with them? How do we analyze, use them to analyze turbulence flow? If you recall in the previous video, in turbulent flow, we couldn't make any assumptions of the instantaneous flow field. Things were unsteady and 3D, leaving the Navier-Stokes equations quite a mess. However, we can certainly make assumptions about the time average flow field represented by the Rand's equations. This is because some turbulent flows are actually steady and 2D on average. Let's try it out. Consider our favorite flow example, closed channel flow. This time, however, it's turbulent. Draw our schematic of the velocity profile, boundaries, and meaningful parameters to set up our problem. Here we consider only the average velocity field, so u bar. In our assumptions, the flow is incompressible, fully developed, steady, two dimensional, and two component. Note here only w bar is zero. Technically w prime is non-zero and we can get products of u prime and w prime. And also there are no body forces in the problem. Remember, at any instant these assumptions can apply, things vary all over the place. But if you consider a time average of the flow, these assumptions can work. Start as we always do with the conservation of mass. Two terms go away because of our assumption. Integrating, we find that v bar must be a constant, and since our boundary conditions define v bar to be zero at some point, we know v bar is zero everywhere. This is the same procedure as with lambda channel flow. All right, next up we have the conservation of momentum in the x direction. Write out the complete Rand's equation for it. A lot of terms go away because we can say things are steady, fully developed, 2D, and 2C, and there are no body forces. Additionally, conservation of mass told us V bar is zero. This is almost exactly the same as laminar channel flow, with one primary but important difference. This pesky U prime V prime term on the left hand side sticks around. This term represents one of the Reynolds stresses which as a result is balanced by the mean pressure gradient and the mean viscous force terms on the right hand side. This and the other Reynolds stresses are a point of a lot of modern research. We currently try to use physics based models to assume the behavior of this function. The Reynolds stresses simultaneously represent the forefront and the barrier of our understanding of turbulence. Without these Reynolds stresses, we would simply have laminar flow on average, but this term makes a huge difference in the end flow behavior and statistics. Regardless, using these Rand's equations gives us functions that are much more approachable and are valuable tools in analysis. In practice, the Rand's equations are useful because, first and foremost, averages are how we measure things. Finding equipment that can take accurate, instantaneous readings is difficult or nearly impossible. Even the image frames of a video are averaged over a certain period of time. You stick a probe in your flow, and you take average statistics to get the velocity. Averaging allows us to get better statistical measurements. The more measurements you have to average, 
the lower your measurement error becomes and the more accurate you get. And lastly, to come full circle to the beginning of the video, averages tend to be what matters. In application, you use average lift, average drag, or average pressure drop to do all sorts of things. And that's it. It was a long one today, so let's review. We started by revisiting our faucet to notice that, in turbulence, quantities fluctuate, but they can still have some coherent mean or general behavior. To separate out all the mess, we use Reynolds decomposition to split a time-varying signal into its mean and fluctuating components. Keep in mind, instantaneous observations are what is exactly happening. An average is just a statistic that doesn't physically exist. In application, we tend to care mostly about averages. We applied Reynolds decomposition to a working example, and this introduced some rules of equation averaging that we needed to constantly utilize. Looking at the product of two sine waves taught us specifically why products of correlated fluctuating signals give us extra terms when decomposing and averaging. Then we set out to derive the Reynolds to average Navier-Stokes equations, which are just the conservation equations that have been Reynolds decomposed and averaged. After a brief derivation, we were there. These equations define the behavior of an incompressible fluid entirely, but only in the average sense. We finished by showing off how useful these equations can be for something like turbulent channel flow. In the end, the equations were very similar to laminar flow, but with extra terms called Reynolds stresses, which define our limit of turbulence understanding. In practice, these equations are an incredibly useful tool when analyzing all types of turbulent flows. I hope you enjoyed the video, and thanks for watching.